What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Primetime Sports Podcast, hosted by Joe Miller. So this weekend is College Football Championship Weekend. A lot of big games, a lot of big conference championship games. I'm going to preview each one of them and give you my thoughts on the bigger games. So we'll start off with the Pac-12 Championship, which is tonight. Number five, Oregon at number three, Washington. It'll be played in Nevada, so there's really no home team here. But regardless, Washington is the higher-ranked team at number three. Michael Penix versus Bo Nix, two great quarterbacks going at it. Both looking like first-round picks in April. Michael Penix on the year, 368 passing yards per game, 24 passing touchdowns, 6 interceptions. Bo Nix, 302 passing yards per game, 25 touchdowns, 2 interceptions. Both miraculous quarterbacks who've had a great season. Washington beat Oregon early this season, even though Oregon made a lot of mistakes in that one. They missed a field goal at the end that could have given them a chance to win. Washington is the underdog here, but I think they're going to win this one. Oregon has a bit of defense, so I know a lot of people leaning their way since they've been dominant both ways all season. But I like Michael Penix more. I trust him more than I trust Bo Nix. I'm going to roll the Huskies winning this one 31-27. Next up, we have the Conference USA Championship, which is tonight. New Mexico State at number 24, Liberty. Liberty is actually the home team in this game. New Mexico State turned this season around after losing their opener this season to UMass, which is obviously a tough start to the season. Liberty's undefeated and just recently were recognized as a team ranked in the college football playoff rankings, which is great to see. To finally get the recognition they deserve for an undefeated season. I think Liberty takes care of business here, and I think they win a close one, 24-20. Next up for Saturday's games, we have the Big 12 Championship with number 18, Oklahoma State, versus number 7, Texas. Both offenses are great here, averaging over 30 points per game. Texas' defense was elite, giving up just 17 points per game. Oklahoma State giving up 27 points per game. One thing to watch out for in this game, though, is Oklahoma State running back Ollie Gordon. 132 rushing yards per game, 20 rushing touchdowns on the season in 12 games, also has a touchdown reception as well, so 21 total touchdowns. He is a game-breaking talent that could definitely keep Oklahoma State in this game. As a Texas at quarterback, they've Quinn Ewers, 17 passing touchdowns, 5 interceptions, 271 passing yards per game in the season. They've won six games in a row. I think Oklahoma State's going to stay close in this game, but I think Texas ends up winning this one 30-24. to but I think they could be an upset pick here. I think Oklahoma State is going to be right there in this one. I wouldn't be surprised if they were to win this game. Nobody's given them a shot, but their offense is great. And if you look at Ollie Gordon, he's a game-breaking talent. Next up for the MAC championship game, we have Miami, Ohio versus Toledo. Toledo is 11-1, Miami, Ohio at 10-2. Both teams have good defenses, but I'd say Miami, Ohio is better on defense, while Toledo probably is a better offense overall. Daquan Finn, great season, 21 passing touchdowns, 8 interceptions, 6 rushing touchdowns on the year. I think Toledo is the better team, though. I think they win this one 23-17. Next up for the SEC Championship game, we have number one Georgia versus number eight Alabama. Alabama averaging 36 points per game. Georgia at 40 points per game. So both offenses are obviously great. And then both their defenses are exceptional as well, giving up under 18 points per game for both of those defenses. It's going to be an absolute battle between these two teams. Whichever team wins, they're likely going to make the college football playoff. Whichever team loses will likely be out. I think Alabama is rolling right now. They need to win this game, obviously, to try to get into the college football playoff. They need some other things to go their way as well. But they start off the season on the wrong foot. They were struggling, couldn't really figure out who was going to be their quarterback. They were switching in and out of different quarterbacks to see which one was going to be the guy. And Jalen Merrill ended up being the guy for them at the quarterback position. He had a great pass last week, a fourth down miracle pass last week, which gave him a big win over Auburn. Very close game, came down to the last play of the game. Fourth down miracle play from the 31-yard line. Jalen Monroe found Isaiah Bond in the end zone for the game-winning touchdown. And it was quite a play from the young quarterback. Finding his footing over the last six games or so has been huge for the progression of this Alabama team. It's given them a shot for the college football playoff, which at the beginning of the season, no one really saw this team being able to turn things around. Fourth down a goal, though, is the most beautiful play in the game of football for plays like that. From Jalen Monroe finding Isaiah Bond, that play like that is why the game of football is so beautiful. Their college football playoff chances are in the hands of Milrow, fourth and goal on the 31-yard line, and he comes up with a strike, which I don't know why Auburn only rushed two pass rushes. That gave Milrow all day to throw. It's a big reason he was able to find Bond. It's really impossible for any defensive back to cover a guy for 10, 11, 12 seconds in the end zone. But Milrow, nevertheless, found the play, made a great pass, and obviously credit to him there for making that play. I think Alabama surprises here, though. I really haven't been a big fan of Georgia all year long. Even though they're dominant, they always find ways to win. They always find ways to beat teams whenever you doubt them. And they always make a statement whenever you do so. But I'm still not fully bought into Carson Beck. I know he's had a good season. But at the beginning of the year, I wasn't fully bought into him. I'm still not fully bought into him yet. Probably need another big game or so against a team like Alabama to fully buy in on him. But I think Alabama's a better team here. I really do. I think they surprise here, and I think they win this one 34-30. Next up for the ACC Championship game, we have number 14, Louisville, versus number 4, Florida State. Louisville has a slight advantage here, I'd say, considering Jordan Travis is done for the year, so it's a big loss for Florida State, a quarterback. 
And Florida State also has all the pressure on them in this game, considering they need this win to stay in the college football playoff talks, which I think they may even be out even if they win this game because the committee probably doesn't want to see a backup quarterback. Even though it's unfair to a team that's undefeated, they should probably get in just for the undefeated record. They still may not get in because nobody probably wants to see a backup quarterback in the college football playoff. But it's up to the committee at the end of the day. Florida State's quarterback for tomorrow's game is probably going to be Tate Rodemaker, but he is a game-time decision. So it could be third-string quarterback Brock Glenn getting the start for them, which would be crazy to see. And they're probably going to ask a lot from Trey Benson, their running back, to lead that offense. They need a quarterback to get the ball to Keon Coleman, one of the best wide receivers and one of the best talents in the country. He's an absolute stud. But at the end of the day, you need a quarterback to get him the ball. I think Jack Plummer in Louisville is going to win this one 27-23. And lastly, the last college football championship game I'm going to talk about is the Big Ten championship game between number 16, Iowa, and number 2, Michigan. Iowa's defense is just as good as Michigan's. But the Hawkeyes' inability to score the ball is a big issue here. Their offense is definitely a worry for me in this game. Michigan's coming off a big win last week over Ohio State, which solidified their college football playoff chances. If they could just win this game against Iowa, they're going to be in for sure. But I think they could be set up for a close game versus Iowa if they take them lightly. And one thing for that Michigan offense, I still haven't bought into J.J. McCarthy yet. I know a lot of people are a big fan of him considering what they saw from this season. I'm not sold on him yet. I still don't really believe in him fully yet. And that's why I'd worry about drafting him in the NFL draft. I think he's going to still be a first-round pick, considering how good he's been this season. But I still haven't really bought into him yet. That game against Penn State, where they ran the ball consecutively for like 40 or 50 straight plays and didn't even pass the ball from the midway point of the game and just ran the ball all over Penn State, that worries me. Even though they were running the ball very well versus Penn State, and you do what works, it's still a worry that they just said, yeah, we don't even have to pass the ball in this game. We can just run. Is that something that they worried about? Maybe they worried about J.J. McCarthy throwing the ball? I'm not really too sure. They won the game regardless, but I'm still not fully bought into J.J. McCarthy yet. I'm not. As at Michigan's defense, great to see Everett, Massachusetts native. Mike Sainer is still absolutely balling for them this season. He's going to be an NFL draft pick in April for sure. He's been one of the best players overall this season. I think Iowa's going to be in this game, but I think Michigan wins this one overall 27-13. to So now to close out the episode, I'm going to talk about some college hockey games for this weekend. Number one, Boston College is hosting Northeastern tonight. BC is the number one team in the country. They had wins over Denver, two versus Michigan State, and a win over Quinnipiac, all within their first six games of the season. They start off the season harder than any team in the country. They are 11-2-1 overall this year. Gabe Perot has been great. Three goals, 17 assists, 20 points. Will Smith, another freshman, six goals, 13 assists, and 19 points. Riley Leonard, another freshman, nine goals, seven assists, 16 points overall. Cutter Godier, 12 goals, six assists, 18 points for the sophomore. All four of those guys were first-round picks in the NHL draft over the last two years. Godier was two years ago, and then Perot, Smith, and Leonard were all drafted in the first round in this past NHL draft. Their goalie is freshman Jacob Fowler, who's been great as well. 1.97 goals against him per game and a 9.31 save percentage. As for Northeastern, they had 3-7-1 overall, 0-7-2 in the Hockey East. Never could have seen a this bad of a start from this team, even though I knew they'd struggle this season, and I knew they wouldn't be the team they were for the last four seasons just about. I didn't see them struggling this much to begin the season. I thought they'd be a 500 team just about all season long. But seeing them at 0-7-2 in the Hockey East is definitely a worry. But they're a young team with a lot of key pieces leaving over the last year. And they've also dealt with a lot of injuries this season. They're coming off a 92 win over a weak RPI team this past Sunday. It was 4-0 within the first 15 minutes of the game. Cam Wand, they need more from. Three goals, seven assists, ten points on the season. Justin Rutzkovian, three goals, five assists, eight points. He's battled injuries at the start of the season, but definitely still one of the best talents in all of college hockey. Northeastern's goalie is Cameron Whitehead, 2.7 goals against and an 8.98 save percentage. He has struggled to begin the season, but he is a young goalie. They don't have Devin Levi anymore, no Jaden Struble, no Ada McDonough, no Sam Colangelo, no Jack Hughes, no Riley Hughes, no Yakov Novak. All a big difference seeing all those guys go within the last year, and then obviously Jordan Harris a couple years ago. But if Northeastern can find a way to split this series this weekend, that would be huge, and I think they're capable of it. Northeastern still has the talent, and they're definitely better than their record shows. They're still probably not going to be a top three to four team in the Hockey East this season, but I still think they're a probably fifth or sixth team in the Hockey East. Talent-wise, I think that's where they stand. I still think they're a middle-of-the-pack Hockey East team. I don't think they're really at the bottom like they are right now. I think they're better than that, even though the record does show 0-7-2, and, and a lot of people say you are what your record shows. They did battle a lot of injuries to be in the season. I think they're going to find their footing at some point. I still think they'll probably be... 6th, 7th, or 8th probably in the Hockey East. I don't see them as the 11th team in the Hockey East, though. I really don't. I think Northeastern wins tonight at BC 4-3. And then I think they lose tomorrow night at Matthews Arena 5-2. Also in the Hockey East tonight, we have UMaine hosting UNH. That's a big showdown. Maine is number 11 in the country. UNH is number 15. 
both of those in the NCAA rankings from this past week. But those two teams, the two under-the-radar squads in the Hockey East, that started the year very hot. I liked what I've seen from both of them. UNH last season, even though they didn't really have a great record last year, they fought in a lot of games, and I saw some talent there. They were a young team last year and brought a lot of talent back this season. And that's why you see guys like Sila Clerk and the rest of the team really stepping up. Sila Clerk's been a stud for them. Seven goals, seven assists, and 14 points. Jacob Helston, their goalie, four wins on the year. 1.3 goals against average with a 937 save percentage. The best goalie in college hockey to begin the season. And then as for Maine, their goalie is one of the best goalies in all the hockey East, but he really hasn't started the year very hot. An 893 save percentage and a 251 goals against average. Wait for him to heat up. This main team is going to be even better when he gets back on track. I think this is going to be an exciting battle, but I think UNH wins tonight's game 4-3. to three. But two teams I like a lot. I'm going to be rooting for a good game here. And that's what I think is going to happen. I think it's going to be an exciting game down to the wire, but I think the Wildcats are the better team. I think they win this one 4-3. They've played with the chip on their shoulder all season long, have had wins against BU, Quinnipiac, and Northeastern already on the season. Northeastern is a team that's given UNH a lot of trouble over the last couple of years. But obviously now it's flipped. UNH is not a team that you can just stomp on in the Hockey East anymore. They're not. They're better than that. One of the best goalies in all college hockey in Houston. Probably the best goalie in college hockey right now, I'd say. And then Sila Clerk, who was an absolute stud and showed a lot of talent last season. And obviously the numbers are showing that this year as well. I think it's going to be a good game. I think UNH wins this one, though, 4-3. to three. Anyways, it will conclude this episode. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this. As always, I appreciate it. I hope you guys have a good one, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Have a great weekend, and take care. Thank you.